to what we could expect, kind of like we're seeing Silver Eagle premiums ratchet up and up and up and up all of a sudden over the last couple of days. And I wonder, is that a precursor to what we can expect to see here uh, soon? I mean, and every single time it's the Silver Eagle that leads the way. And we've seen two or three or four price increases, little by little, 5, 10, 15 cents at a pop uh, over the last couple of days. So, you know, little indications, if you will, that you look for some sort of a, of a telltale of, of what's coming and whether it be much larger orders by very, very sophisticated traders or seeing the Silver Eagle premium start to creep up. Maybe, maybe some people are starting to wake up after all in what has really been a mystery to me, how quiet it has been in, in a world that Seems a whole heck of a lot more concerning to me than anything I've seen over the last three years. Now, Andy Sheckman shares his insights as a metals broker and explains the current market premiums and numismatic values for gold and silver and shares a message for everyone stacking precious metals. If you've got physical gold and silver, this video is for you. I think kind of telling, if you will, you know, you always see the biggest money move ahead of the of the crowd and it's not because they're more sophisticated because they have more money it's that they they associate in circles where information is more fluid and more relevant and more timely nobody and people only bought numismatics and with 350 dollar gold you'd pay 380 for a gold eagle and 410 for a certified uncirculated ms62 20 dollar liberty there'd be no reason to buy bullion when you could buy a hundred year old coin that was saved from confiscation, was a piece of Americana, was a real piece of history that had much better upside potential for 30 bucks more. Well, you know, that was 9% more or whatever, but so what? Um, and when I was accumulating those coins early on in my career, that's all I would buy myself. I never really bought it because I was concerned about confiscation. I bought it because they are really a true rarity. They're 100 plus years old. And technically, they they would be safe from confiscation according to the way the laws are written. But there's something about them. When you're looking at a coin from you know 1880s, 1870s, 1890s, early 1900s, you're looking at a coin that's 100 plus years old. When the world was very different, um, there's something to be said for it. And I think that the wow factor is is you know you get that for free that's great um and the, i've never ever met anyone who who has looked at a 20 dollar gold piece I mean, most people don't know that gold was money prior to 1933 but you put a 100 year old 20 dollar gold piece in someone's hands and the, it's universal wow that is so cool i think there's something to be said for that so it's just i was always drawn to them i gravitated to them and but since 2008 the premiums got so high that i had to move away from it because in reality as richard russell said in the end it's about the number of ounces that matter but you have to tailor that with you know not being penny wise and pound foolish and i guess if you are able to get the pre-33 coins in the same ballpark as the new stuff yeah i i would do it i do prefer it and always have and there's something to be said for something that you know it's not rare but it's not common either and there's it's just a really neat way to accumulate gold just my personal preference more than anything and you know do it the right way and, and you do in theory have safety from from any governmental shenanigans silver gives up early gain at the 200 day exponential moving average silver initially tried to rally during the course of the trading session on thursday reaching the 200 day moving average we have seen a lot of selling pressure there if we do break down from here i would actually welcome that as silver is likely to continue looking at the 22 dollar level as a potential floor in the market on the upside we have the 23 dollar 50 level which is also a barrier that I think will be difficult to overcome. Now we'll show you more clips of Andy Sheckman, but first like subscribe and turn on notifications and check our pinned comment for some massive sign up bonuses. Enjoy the video. To wonder what that is going to do to the system, this, this, this crisis, if you will, of credit, this, this slush fund that has been available, not only to the banks to reliquify them selling their 
their uh, treasuries that were valued at 50, 60 cents on the dollar, selling it at par or 100% face value, that money has to be paid back. And that money has to be paid back, supposedly, starting March 11th. Now, the loans are being made up until March 11th, which in theory means that you have a lag, if you will. If they're still getting loans up to March 11th, that would mean that one year from March 11th is when all hell would break loose because not all of the loans were made at the very beginning. In fact, many of the loans were made during this, this last few months where they were able to uh, to um, borrow at 4.7% and then give it back to the Fed in a different window and get paid 5.3%, just the complete and total lunacy. But yeah, if they're true to their word, which I guess at this point, it's very hard to believe anything that they say. And we've been saying this all along that, you know, rates aren't going to go down and at least not in the foreseeable future, they will lose all credibility if they do that. And inflation is here to stay. And you know, just go out to dinner once and tell me that inflation is not really here. And it is here and it's not going away. And it's, um, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, just look at the basics. How the heck do you pay for uh, Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and government military pensions on top of the $34 trillion debt obligation? How do you pay for all these liabilities to the American public when the rest of the world are selling treasuries Who's going to buy our bonds? Who's going to finance the uh, the the ridiculous uh, debt uh, binge that the federal government is on? They're addicted to debt. Who's going to finance it? And let alone the nearly ten trillion dollars in in two year treasuries. I think eight trillion in two year treasuries that need to either be rolled over at higher rates now or or paid off. Who's gonna Who's gonna do that? And how does that happen? And so I think inflation is here to stay and will only get worse. And so when you put it all together, we are running into some very dangerous times if indeed they uh, they do stop this and they they do stop the the, the funding program. You're looking at a, a banking crisis and it would be hard to believe that they'll let that happen in an election year where you'll start to see um, a run on the banks but, um, you know, indeed, I would say the likelihood of this happening closer to 2025 in March, because, you know, there are still banks that are taking advantage of this until March 11th. And those loans are good for one year. So don't expect something crazy to happen March 11th, I would say, as we get into the following year. Inflation figures dictated the trajectory of the gold market this week. The notable event was a significant drop in prices on Tuesday morning, triggered by unexpectedly high CPI data for January. Spot gold, which was per ounce minutes before the announcement, plummeted. Subsequently, prices mainly fluctuated within a narrow $12 range on either side of the $2,000 mark until a minor downturn occurred following Friday morning's PPI release. However, there was a swift but modest recovery followed by a gradual ascent leading into the precedence day long weekend. Now we'll show you more clips of and, and his insights on the precious metals markets. But first, like subscribe and turn on notifications. Let's get into the video. This is a very important point. You know, the Embridge is a bridge that allows these, these digital currencies, these nations' currencies, to trade with one another, um, sidestepping the SWIFT system, which is the, the way that the United States imposes, one of the ways they impose sanctions. And, you know, maybe I'm guilty as well of focusing too much on the Russian finance minister's proclamation that, hey, we're going to have a uh, a... a unified settlement currency that will be pegged to a basket of commodities. And maybe that will happen, right? But look at what's been happening, right? If you look at uh, China, as an example, at one point they had almost $3 trillion worth of our treasuries. They're down to seven or 800 billion. It's still a lot, but they are shedding treasuries at a rapid rate, the lowest level they've had in 17, 16, 17, 18 years. And the same thing is is true of many of these 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 BRICS nations that are no longer bidding for our treasury. So when you think about it, you know we were told at the end of the August meeting that they would all go back, the finance ministers, to the drawing board, come back and present their findings for a common settlement currency. But in the meantime, everyone trade in their 
local currencies. And that is indeed what we are seeing. And more proclamations all throughout the BRICS nations, whether it be India, whether it be Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, you know, um, uh, Russia, they're all trading with one another using local currencies. And the difference, the delineation here, when we talk about that particular move, right, trading outside the dollar in local currencies, well, you know, we saw 20% of oil sales uh, settle in, in other currencies this year. That's a big uh, divergence. But as we continue to see this BRICS conglomerate grow, and, and there's another 35 countries that have formally applied and 20 that have express interest in this mass adoption grows and all of these countries agree to trade in local currencies remember the petrodollar is not just the dollar being uh the what oil is sold for that's part of it the other part was taking the excess and the reserves and putting it into u.s treasuries so number one you start to chip away at the settlement status of the dollar which is is big deal especially as we see more and more and more of these oil producing countries be part of the the, the BRICS group and and all of these countries that produce the world's commodities as part of this group that always settled in dollars will now settle in local currencies and instead of taking that excess the the excess currency that they would otherwise have just sitting there earning nothing, they would typically put it into U.S. treasuries, which are very liquid and very safe. Well, instead, what you're seeing is two plus years, almost three years in a row of the central banks, the people who know the playbook, not just the wealthiest, but the most well-informed buying gold at levels the world's never seen. And now you're seeing all the exchanges being bled dry, a continuation of what we've been talking about for three years. What does that mean? That means they're selling treasuries, not rolling them over and reinvesting them, but instead buying gold. And look at this, the the look at the how that's played out for the last 24 years. If you go back to 2000, gold is appreciated by 7.8% per year. The S&P, 7%. And the bond market, less than half of that. So you have no default risk, no counterparty risk. It's an asset that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. You have much less in the way of interest and inflation risk as it pertains to using gold instead of U.S. treasuries as the replacement for the reserve. So if they settle in other currencies and put the excess into gold, as it very much appears like they are doing, you will begin to rapidly, and I mean rapidly, chip away at the dollar hegemony. And I think it's important to note, you know, you look at what the lead analyst for Citibank said. I want to read this to you real quick. Uh, gold, which is currently trading at 2016, could surge by 50% if central banks sharply ramp up purchases of the ye yellow metal, a possible stagflation, or in the case of a deep global recession, uh, Akash Doshi, City's North American head of commodities research, told CNBC. But here's where... It fits in here. He says the most likely wildcard path to $3,000 per ounce gold is a rapid acceleration of an existing but slow moving trend, de dollarization across emerging markets, central banks that in turn leads to a crisis of confidence in the US dollar. Well, I mean, how is there not already a crisis of confidence in the US dollar with the amount of inflation, with the destabilization of the bond market, with the sanctioning and weaponizing and now confiscating, I think that those confiscation um, aspirations of not just sanctioning, but taking it to fund the Ukraine will have massive consequences where we will never be trusted again by li literally anyone in the Southern Hemisphere, if not much more wide reaching. So I think this is happening and it doesn't have to come under the, the guise of a common settlement currency yet. Maybe that's down the road, but the fact of not trading in dollars and not buying treasuries will have a very big effect, a very big effect. And I think it's happening. right. What do you think of today's episode? Do you agree with Andy Sheckman? Do you feel secure with your savings in dollars? Post in the comment section down below your insights on the video, especially if you'd feel safer having crypto than money in your bank account. Thanks for watching it to the end. Take advantage of the massive sign up bonuses to get crypto. If you have not yet done so, subscribe to the channel and check this upcoming video because you'll love it. I see you on the other side.